nombre es Hugo Pacheco, yo soy el director de Relaciones Públicas para The Walt Disney Company México. Y pues bueno, es un, es un privilegio que estén el día de hoy con, con nosotros en, en otro evento más de, de The Walt Disney, ahora con, con Star Wars. Y, y muy contentos también. Eh, antes de iniciar la conferencia me, me encantaría platicarles que el día de hoy Coco llegó a los 20 millones de asistentes en México. Y también estamos cerca de los mil millones de pesos en recaudación, una cifra que, que nunca se había visto en, en México. Así que estamos muy orgullosos y gracias a todos ustedes. Espero que la hayan visto y que también la hayan eh, gozado y, y, y ya está llorado con nosotros. Así que bueno, eh, pues hoy estamos muy contentos porque tenemos a, al director, al productor, al talento de, de una de las franquicias más queridas y más adoradas en todo el mundo. Y, y bueno, este, pues Star Wars se estrena en México el 14 de diciembre, para que, para que no se la pierdan. Y bueno, para mí es un gran privilegio poder invitar a nuestra conferencia de prensa a Ryan Johnson, que es el director de Star Wars, Los Últimos Jedi. Le pido un aplauso, por favor, a, para recibir a Ryan. Las fotos serán al final, okay. así que no se preocupen. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome to Mexico. También nos acompaña el productor, a quien le pido un fuerte aplauso, Ram Berman, por favor. Una actriz que no necesita presentación, muy, muy, muy joven, muy, muy guapa. Y démosle un aplauso a Ray, que es Daisy Ridley, por favor. Y por último, alguien que, que ha crecido con mucho de, de nosotros y que es un gran personaje, que lo, que lo queremos. Una gran persona, además. Un fuerte aplauso para Mark Hamill. Thank you guys for being here. Okay, es, si pueden tomar asiento, por favor. Uh, if you want to, to use the headset translation. Eh, de, eh, las preguntas pueden ser en inglés o en español, tenemos eh, traducción simultánea. Entonces, vamos a empezar, por favor. Por ahí les dimos unas, unas paletitas, unos eh, hand, hand signals. Por favor, ¿quién, los, ¿quién tiene por ahí? Empezamos con la primera pregunta. Ok, adelante, por favor. Nombre y medio, por favor. And the people for glasses. Yeah, <laughs> just a minute. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm here. Um, I wanted to ask you, all of you, what do you think Star Wars has become when it comes uh, as a way of living through pop culture in the last few decades? What do you think Star Wars is right now in the world? And why do we need the day that the one we have loved these many years with the Star Wars? Yeah, Ryan. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you guys for having us. We've had such an amazing welcome here in Mexico City. It's a real joy to be here. Um, uh, I, I mean, Star Wars, it's, it's many things. It's something that I know that um, I and a lot of us grew up with. It's also, though, for me, the most amazing thing is to see um, both people my age who are wearing the t-shirts and who are into Star Wars, but also in Halloween to see little girls dressed as Rey, or to see how it crosses all generations. Um, and there's very few things out there right now in the world that do that, and that speak to a message that's positive, and that give kids today kind of a roadmap to kind of find their place in the world and, and try and try and follow the, follow the light side. So I think it's more important today than it ever has been. The movies were always very optimistic. Um, they came out in a time post-Watergate, uh, post-Vietnam War, when the 
usually you had an anti-hero who was embittered, coming back from the war, the factories closed. I think George chose to put it in a galaxy far, far away because that's as close as you can come to making a, a fairy tale in outer space. And when I read it, I thought, gee, they have a princess, a space pirate, a farm boy, a wizard. It, it's closer to Wizard of Oz than it is to any science fiction. And particularly today, uh, history repeats itself. We're in a very, very dark era, and uh, people need that escapism. Whether they want to go to Hogwarts or the Land of Oz or Middle Earth, uh, it's a great place to go to forget about your troubles. Um, to add to the escapism thing, I, I just think it's amazing because I didn't really grow up with Star Wars, so this has all been like a new thing the past few years. Um, and I just think it's amazing, especially at conventions, to see just people are really kind to each other. Like, Star Wars fans are really lovely to each other. When you go to a convention, people have the most far-fetched ideas as to what the story may be, that everybody has a right to an opinion, everybody has a voice, everybody is heard. So you can hear the most insane fan theory, but everyone in that group who's listening to the theory is giving that person the space to have it. So I think there's just an awesome sense of community within the fans. Okay. It's hard for me to add. All I can see, say is that I have two kids, two boys, who are just obsessed with this, and I can't understand why. They've never seen, you know, they've never seen my movie, our movie, but they're just every time Star Wars is on TV, they want, you know, they want to leave the screen. They just want to get dressed as don't two girl porks, and. and, and, and it really is. It's hard to articulate why, but it's just magic. How old really are is. they now? Seven and four. Oh, that's my crowd. <laughs> the young and the mentally young. <laughs> okay, thank you. Arriba su... Adelante, por favor. Aquí de pie. Quien la tenga lista, por favor. Gracias. Hi, my question is for Mark and Javier in the middle. Uh, I'm from CNN, and you have wrote at the same time as Luke Skywalker. How do you think the character and yourself have matured? And how do you feel knowing that Luke is a movie icon as important as Rocky, The Godfather, and even like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? Thank you. Well, we had in the original trilogy a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there was closure. My father had found redemption, uh, and then you would just speculate. It, you know, we all lived happily ever after, and uh, as you'll discover in the Last Jedi, uh, things haven't gone the way you'd expect. Uh, it was—it's a much darker uh, place for Luke to be. Ryan pushed me out of my comfort zone, and it was scary, you know. Uh, because Luke did represent hope and optimism. And, uh, but you know, you need conflict. If I were another sort of benign uh, trainer of uh, young Padawans, we've seen that before. And I think the real challenge for any writer or director is to deliver all the elements that you, the audience wants to see in a Star Wars film, the spectacular battles and special effects and exotic creatures, the wonderful character relationships, and the humor is so important. Uh, but to find ways to surprise people, which is getting more and more difficult with each film, because the, the audience has seen so much. But uh, I think they're, if they're as shocked as I was to read the script, the audience is in for a, a great time at the movies with, uh, with this film. And by the way, I don't think of myself as Rocky or any of those. Not when, you know, you're at home and your wife is telling you to take out the trash and <laughs> pick up your room. It's very mundane existence. Thank you. Por ahí, por favor. Si quieres, ponte de pie y para que lo vean. Hi, good morning. 
Para Jonathan, para Mundo Mórbido y Mórbido TV, una pregunta para Mar Hamil. ¿Cómo te sentiste el primer día de regreso como Luke Skywalker en un rodaje de una nueva película de Star Wars? ¿Te sentiste nervioso o no sé si temeroso, emocionado por lo que pudieran pensar los fans? Y para todos, ¿qué significa ser parte del universo de Star Wars? Gracias. Sí, yes, well, coming back was uh, a thrill, but enormously intimidating. You know, we have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I thought, how, why mess with that? You know, we always expected the the future trilogies would feature all new characters that they wouldn't need us. Uh, but, you know, you have to rise to the challenge. And I, I thought it was interesting, the first day I met Ryan, and he came to visit and get to know one another, and I confessed to him, I'm terrified. <laughs> you know, I like little films. I did Brinkley Bear this year. We drive around in suburbia in cars. You know, Star Wars is almost too high profile for comfort. So I was surprised when I confessed how terrified I was. He said, I am too. And I thought, wow, he didn't have to admit that. Well, I bonded with him at that very moment. Because <laughs> if I really intellectually uh, imagined how big it really was, I would just be crippled with fear. Uh, so I had to pretend it was a small art house film that the critics would embrace, but the audiences would uh, reject in mass numbers. That's what I, I pretended. It's fun to pretend. Yeah, and the, just adding what Mark said, that there were the kind of those two layers, I think. For me, coming into it as kind of, you know, as, as, as the new kid, there was first kind of the shock and awe of we're doing Star Wars with a capital SW, kind of the big picture of it. Um, but then once we actually started working, I didn't find that it took a lot of effort to fool ourselves into thinking we were making a smaller movie. It felt very intimate, and I think that's a testament to just the group of people that we had working on it, to you guys, to the whole cast, It just everyone kind of was, our eyes were on the right target, I think, right. of just making an interesting movie. And when you put your eyes on that target, everything around you kind of shrinks down, and you're just trying to tell a story. And that's what it felt like, I think. Or I think you're so focused on what you're doing in the moment, you can't think about facing all you guys a year and a half later. Now's when I should be really scared. I'm terrified. <laughs> okay, thank you. Number you made it. Hi, Gabriel. Hi, Gabriel from uh, Polo Metro. Uh, this for for the producer. Uh, Star Wars has some of the best special effects and movie and, and spaceships and weapons of the cinema. Uh, how is the balance that uh, to to have to use? Big sets like like the Millennium Falcon, and improve the special effects with every movie, so people also have a sensation of uh, of wow. I mean, our approach initially was, you know, we wanted to do as much as possible practical, so we end up building like almost like 120 sets, which is like insane amount of number of sets, and then we always. Of course, have to complement it with visual effects, and we have the great team at ILM that was headed by visual effects named Ben Morris, who work with Ryan. And you know, I cannot really tell you how, what a fantastic job they've done. And we also had Neil Scanlon was a creature effects guy, so we, you know, hopefully push the envelope a little bit and doing a lot of things practically, but also with the help of the visual effects. Okay, thank you. Eh, hola, ya una pregunta. Eh, Radio Disney. Te pones de pie, por favor. Uh, a mí me dio miedo, pero no soy Radio Disney. <laughs> okay, bueno, si, si ya lo tienes, empecemos contigo y después Radio Disney, por favor. Eh, 
Uh, hi, uh, Gonzalo Lira from Cinema Mobile. Uh, I would like to ask something to Daisy. Uh, I think that uh, we've, uh, we've noticed that in this film, uh, Mark or Luke uh, is, is also a protagonist with you. Uh, given the, given the, what's happening right now in Hollywood, uh, the debate around the place of women, Uh, in Hollywood, what, how important do you think that it is to uh, man maintain uh, a female character uh, as strong and as important as your character was in the first uh, in the first film of this new trilogy? Um, I really don't think there's any um, way that anyone could think it wasn't a good thing. Um, <laughs> but what I think actually is especially amazing about this is Ray was created by Michael, JJ, and Larry three men, and Ray continues to be created by men. Obviously, there are women in that team. Kathy is incredible, and Ron Luke as well. But I think what's brilliant is the combination of the two, because we can't do one thing without the other. We can't just have, we can't have it that just women are feeling progress and men aren't, or vice versa. So to be playing an incredibly empowered woman in a wonderful um, film, Uh, surrounded by incredibly empowered characters. Everyone is, everyone is, and there's diversity and there's equality in this film in particular. I think it's, um, for me, like, and I didn't even really think about it until yesterday, I suddenly thought, oh, that was, that was by incredibly empowered men who, who could see what needed to be done and have done it, I think, brilliantly. So I feel very, very lucky to be in the hands I've been, um, in with Ryan and with JJ and with Kathy, with everyone at Disney and Lucasfilm. Um, and I think obviously it's happening in cinema, everyone can see it's happening, that there's more representation across the board. Um, and I feel really lucky that I get to be one of those people that is, um, gets to play those empowered roles. Thank you. Ahora sí seguimos con Radio Disney, por favor. Hi everyone, I'm Fonso Gonzalez from Radio Disney. Um, Each Star Wars film has a unique tone and a mood. So episode three obviously is a little bit darker and maybe episode seven was a, bit, uh, a little bit lighter. So which is the tone and the mood for this uh, film, The Last Jedi film? Well, because it's the middle chapter and because the job of the middle chapter is to kind of challenge the characters, this movie is going to go to some darker places, it's going to be a little bit more, you know, it's going to have a little bit more of that, uh, of that opera in it, I think. But it was very important to me, first and foremost, that it felt like a Star Wars movie. And to me, growing up as a kid, Star Wars movies mean fun, and they mean they're an adventure, and they always, you can have the, the you know, the operatic moments, but they always have one foot in Flash Gordon. And that's essential. And so um, I very much wanted to continue on the tone that I think JJ and Michael Arndt and Larry Kasdan created so brilliantly in The Force Awakens, that, that humor and that fun and that sense of adventure. Um, so there is darkness in the film. I hope that audiences, are, audiences will be pleasantly surprised by how fun and how funny it is. Um, that's my hope. Thank you. Eh, tenemos una pregunta de Canal 11. Adelante, por favor, Canal 11. Hi, Sandra Sittler. Um, you had the opportunity to be with Carrie Fisher in her last movie. Which was your best memory with her? Or, or how was this experience? Is that to me? Uh, you know, everything about Carrie was larger than life. Uh, her, she, like some latter day anti name, she wanted to live life to the fullest in every moment. Uh, I'm selfishly upset that she's not here because if she were, she'd be, you know, giving me the middle finger and making faces at me <laughs> as I tried to answer these questions. Uh, her timing was impeccable, except in this case. But, uh, She, I can't imagine my life without her. She, even though we went for years not seeing one another, we're almost more like real siblings. We'd have big fights and 
scream at each other, and, and, and but there was always that basic level of trust and love. It was so great to be able to reconnect with all the cast in, in, in Force Awakens because, you know, life goes on and you don't see people that you want to as much as you'd like to. Uh, she's wonderful in the film. There's an air of, aura of poignancy that is unavoidable, knowing that this is her last performance. But uh, uh, every time I feel sort of sorry for myself, I have to think about Billy Lord. She lost not only her mother, but her grandmother in the space of two days. It's just unimaginably tragic. But, you know, it's a part and parcel of the films that are about triumph and tragedy and, and you know, continuing on through the worst of adversities. So uh, I'll never stop missing her. And uh, uh, again, uh, it's hard to you know have to deal with that uh, while promoting the film because if, I, if, if life were fair, she'd be here uh, mocking me and all of you. <laughs> okay. Tenemos una de hola. Adelante. Hi, uh, for you, JC. Um, you, Ray has become a role model and a hero for uh, young girls. Um, do you feel any kind of pressure? And um, what did you learn of yourself in The Last Jedi? that you didn't knew before uh, in The Force Awakens? Um, I did feel personal pressure actually going into The Last Jedi because The Force Awakens had just come out like a month before. And so I was sort of dealing with, firstly I'd never been in a film before, so a film I was in came out and then it's a Star Wars film that had come out. And then, you know, people are like, hey, I'm like, hey, what did I do? And they're like, oh no, you're in that film. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's a lot to, to take in. And then, and because I knew what people had responded to in The Force Awakens, in particular my relationship with John, Ray and Finn on their adventure, I um, I think that was my like my my nerves because I thought, oh, if this is the way people are responding, I don't know what I did the first time round that's made people respond like this. And people are so kind, but I don't really understand it, so I don't know how to do that thing again. And if I'm not with John at the beginning, I don't know how to do that because he was like my support network the first time round him and Harrison, but John in particular. Um, so I, I felt nervous because I thought, oh, is this going to do for people what the first one did? Will people respond as strongly to this story as they did with that? And then obviously we were able to have some rehearsal. We sat down and we talked through um, a lot of stuff. And then you realize, yes, it's, it's um, a challenge and different things happen in the galaxy. And that's what's exciting. And that's how people grow. And, and so those nerves went away, but I did. Um, I did feel that very much, and I cannot remember the second part of your question. I'm so sorry. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I don't feel the personal pressure because I'm not Ray. Like um, she's way better than I am. I'm just really lucky to play her. Um, I don't have the the fate of the galaxy resting on my shoulders. I am just in a film that makes people happy. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and I think like, yeah, I don't feel that pressure so much. I think it's really lovely. And because it really was a surprise how people responded, I'm still blown away by how kind people are. And especially when parents are like, I took my daughter and I could get her the costume and she's so happy and like little boys want to run like Ray. And like, that's incredible. There's nothing, it's overwhelming, but there's nothing scary about that. It's just kids being kids it's just it's 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 wonderful it's really wonderful ray has such empathy it's so easy to relate to her and she's sort of analogous to my character because she came from nothing but we shouldn't forget that uh, carrie even though she was royalty was no shrinking violet she wasn't a damsel in distress i the thing that i when i read the script i thought it was so funny first she complained about the the ship that we came to rescue her in, which is so human. And then she was dissatisfied with our rescue. You call this a rescue? And she grabbed her gun and made me and Han look like chumps. So that was effortless feminism. But 
it's it's great to see it continue. And, and like Ryan said, to see these young girls all done up like Ray, it's it's uh, really heartwarming. You know, now they have Wonder Woman, and it's you know Sigourney Weaver and Aliens and Linda Hamilton to the Terminator and so forth, but uh, it's, a, it's a great thing for the empowerment of, of, of the female characters. Hello, over here, Cristina Ibanez from Senza Cine Mexico. Uh, my question is for you, Mark. Um, us Mexicans, we learn a lot about uh, Star Wars and Luke all over these years. Uh, there are a lot of uh, big lessons that even though this is a fiction universe, we can use in our personal lives. But you being here in Mexico for the first time and uh, well, seeing a little bit about us Mexicans, uh, what do you think Luke uh, can learn about us after uh, maybe the <laughs> earthquake we have and the union we show? Maybe is there anything that Luke can learn about Mexican people? Well, of course. I mean, the idea of doing the right thing for the greater good rather than for self-aggrandizement, you know, that there's safety in numbers and that you help the people that are less fortunate than you, those are all tenets of the film. Uh, and by the way, when I was a kid, I did, my father and, uh, was in the Navy, so we lived in San Diego and I went to Tijuana several times, and that's where I got my first Cantin Floss marionette, so <laughs> I'm a big fan of his. But I, I, listen, how can you live in Los Angeles and not love the Latin culture? We're in the minority there. And when you think about where I lived in California, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, are you picking up a trend here? <laughs> so, you know, it's great. It feels like, I mean, the you're so, the people are so warm here, they make you feel like part of the family. Okay, eh, tenemos tiempo para un par de preguntas más. A ver, a ti te vi primero. Okay. Hi, I'm Silva from Guayalice, and my question first for Mark. Um, every Star Wars fan here in the front. <laughs> Every Star Wars fan uh, show love you and show you that love and respect to you. So, do you have any interesting and shocking story that happened to you with the fans of Star Wars of all these years, Big Luke? And for Daisy, um, we don't know who is the family of Rey, and we don't want to know. But <laughs> I don't want you to tell us. But if you could choose as a fan, what would you choose, a Skywalker or a Kenobi? Oh. Well, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> What's she gonna say? Listen, it, just in general about your question about Star Wars fans, what is amazing to me is the passion they have and how they've incorporated the mythology into their own lives. And you hear these personal stories of getting through, uh, you know, terrible times in their own lives. You know, it helped when my sister was in the hospital or I met my husband online and you know we, we had a by the sequel we had a young child and named it Leo or whatever it, it's astonishing they it's uh, it never gets old and I'm I'm just sometimes moved by the fact that they have taken us to heart and and uh, you know, I don't, I don't encounter it on a day-to-day on -day basis. It's usually when I come to fan events and so forth, and, and people tearfully recount how important these films are to them. Because, you know, at the end of the day, there's two and a half hours of escapism. Uh, but as I've learned over the years, it, it means so much more than I could have ever imagined. And the idea that I was a small part of something that made so many people so happy it's just uh, the greatest gift I could have ever been given. Now, back to the Skywalker <laughs> Kenobi question. The thing is, anything I say is going to be, um, you know, uh, more weighted now. Um, uh, what I think is really amazing, because, again, because I, I didn't understand exactly the impact of Star Wars, I... I didn't fully... Well, like, when Force Awakens came out, and I was like, oh, my God, who's your parents? I was like, oh... 
And like, I was genuinely surprised that that was the main question. Because for me, like getting into something, um, eyes wide shut sort of thing, what I found so amazing in The Force Awakens is, is Ray meets Finn, and they've never met before. He's a defected stormtrooper. She's a scavenger. And then we're like <laughs> brother and sister, and it's an amazing connection. And in that moment, like Ray finds a piece of family. And before that, she's met BB-8, and she finds a piece of family. And then she meets Han Solo, she finds a piece of family. And when she's finally with the Resistance, it's like, oh, this is sort of where I belong. And then off she has to go on another adventure. But essentially, Ray is seeking belonging. And so obviously a lot of Star Wars is looking back and wondering where she came from. But I think the wonderful thing, especially about this film, is it's all about progress and the relationships people are making now. And obviously things are influenced by what you had before. But I, I just think it's beautiful the relationships that are formed with people that aren't even necessarily, that wouldn't be classed as family, but family is who you choose, I think. You can choose to love people and bring them into your home and and make a life with a group of people that have no blood relation to you. <laughs> so whatever I say now is going to be taken. So, so in, this, in this film, Ray turns up and, and essentially has a quest from someone else um, for Luke. It's not really about her. She just has to do this thing that she's sort of been asked to do. Um, but because of the space that Ray and Luke have on the island, she's able to ask questions and seek guidance from Luke. And in that moment, again, Ray finds a relationship of sorts, regardless of whatever that is. It's a relationship of sorts, and I think that's what's so wonderful is the people Ray meets. It's like she immediately, she's so open. Like she's been alone for so long, but she's so open to like finding connections with people. Um, and she's not met a Kenobi, so Skywalker. <laughs> hey kid. Maybe you're a solo. <laughs> That's my ears before. <laughs> I have to announce my impressions about the people that don't get with the. Uh... Okay, yes, good morning. Uh, Rodrigo Cervantes for NPR and KTGC in Phoenix. Uh, so, a question in, in general for, for all of you is how do you think that your characters in the movie resonate to the current? Given the current political and economic uh, tensions and situation between Mexico and the United States, is there like any echo on the narrative? And also, uh, particularly for the production, what's the importance of the uh, Mexican and the Latino market for this franchise and for Hollywood in general? That's the wrong question. Yeah. If I've ever heard one. Well, but the first question. <laughs> so for us, clearly, it's, you know, Latin America is a huge market, and. Clearly, it's great for us to be here and see so much the support and the love that there is for the franchise and for the characters. So we hope the movie does well, that people respond to the movie and get everybody to go see the movie and hopefully it continue to grow the franchise for the many years to come. We see analogies from Star Wars used in pop culture and in politics and in current events. And the reason you've seen that for the past 40 years, no matter what the landscape is or what's happening, is because Star Wars, I think, is much more powerful than any direct political analogy ever could be. I think if you make a direct political analogy, it's a, it can immediately be diffused by recognizing the elements of it, disagreeing with them, and saying, blah, you're coming from here or there. I think the power of Star Wars is it's much deeper than that. And it's about the things underneath all that that really matter. Um, and that ultimately inform the stuff that's happening in our day-to-day -day lives. That's why it's so applicable to it. So, um, And I, I think that's the case with the original films, and I, I hope that's the case with what we're doing, doing now. Ok, tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más, por favor. A ver, adelante, por favor. Aquí en el frente. Aquí. Hi, welcome to Mexico. Arturo Tomar from Movix. Daisy, um, yesterday you saw what fans think of Mark, of Luke, how they overwhelmed, it was overwhelming the response that they had. Have you ever thought that in the future that's going to be you? And for Mark, uh, it, it's been said that you know, Star Wars is going to continue, that the universe is going to get wider. Do you think Luke might play a part of it, or do you think it's time for Luke to be 
Do, do we live apart? Am I looking at a retirement plan? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to point out, though, that the enthusiasm last night was for for Daisy and, and for her character as much as it was for me. It was for all things Star Wars and for Ryan as a director. I mean, I'm telling you, I call them UPS. It stands for Ultra Passionate Bands. These, these are the bands that know more about the details of the movies than I do because they read the support, all the ancillary material. They read the novels. They play the games. Uh, you know, uh, they read the comic books. and. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing to me. My my son, who was born when we did Empire Strikes Back, so he has two passports, you know, he has an English passport. He's my go-to guy when I have to call him and I say, Nathan, somebody asked me about Kazizik. What's Kazizik? He goes, Dad, that's the Wookiee planet. I thought, oh, you know, another George Lucas word desperately in need, in need of more vowels because it's K-Y-Z-Z-K-X, you know, unpronounceable names. But uh, you never get used to it, you know. Uh, it never really went away, because I thought, you know, after we finished the first trilogy, there's always something new, uh, a new something coming, a new James Bond, a new Superman, or whatever, and eventually we'd just be a fond memory. But it never really went away. And the, the real passionate fans were, are so supportive, even when you're, you know, doing an off-Broadway show in a, a, a theater that only has 900 seats. They, they're there for you through thick and thin, which has been really important to me. It's really, uh, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be sitting here now. Okay. Bueno, pues muchísimas gracias. Eh, damos por concluida la, la conferencia de prensa. Vamos a tomar una, unas pequeñas fotos. Vamos a hacerlo en, en orden, por favor. Please stand up and put on the front of the stage.